Hi there, for a change this is a repair video instead of a build or a review. Moreover it's part 1 because there are still problems. The patient is this function generator or rather function and pulse generator plus a frequency counter all in one. I got it from a fellow EEV block member, Graham, who said that the display was working but no output signal. He also explained that they gave it to a junior engineer to repair after rediscovering it after years in storage. But that repair did not succeed, but it explains why the screws for the enclosures were missing. Sadly, specs and manuals have also been lost over the years. The unit goes by the name of Global Specialities Type A201. You have probably never heard of it, and neither had I. And the Google search was not getting anything useful either. But Graham was able to give me some important hint that a company called Tabo Electronics marketed the same unit under their name. They still exist in Israel and they have a lot of their old docs available for download, including a unit called SF8021 which seemed to be very similar to my 8201. The 8021 document is a proper user manual, programming guide because this has a proper GPIB interface as well as theory of operation, schematics, parts list, adjustment procedures and so on. This is how manual of quality devices used to be. The only problem with this one was that the front panel clearly shows that the 8021 is very similar but still different from my unit. In the meantime, Graham found another piece of the puzzle in that a German company called Contron Messtechnik once marketed a similar unit, A201. Unfortunately, they don't exist anymore, but some of their assets may have been taken over by Tabor. I contacted Tabor Electronics by email and they were very nice and one of their engineers, Bruno, sent me parts of a Contron 201 manual together with some hints of what may be the issue. A parallel search on the EEV block for someone with a Contron A201 unearthed Tony from Dresden in Germany who not only has a Contron A201 but managed to repair it and got it working. Somehow he also got a complete Contron A201 manual scanned in as a PDF and was kind enough to send me a copy. So now I had a partial copy from Bruno and a complete manual from Tony and I was very happy to see that my global specification branded unit matched the description in the manual. It is as comprehensive as the 8021 manual with theory of operations, schematics, parts list, troubleshooting and so on. I thought this should give me a fair chance to get this running again. Powering it on for the first time and after recent experience with exploding capacitors in an old HP frequency counter I decided to have the camera rolling with a good view towards the power supply at the rear which unfortunately left the front panel rather dark. It identifies as 8241 running firmware 1.6, GPIB address 0 and then shows 0.5006. The 0.5006 means it's set to 0.5 times 10 to the power of 6 or 0.5 MHz. This user interface uses exponent notation for just about everything. No capacitor exploded and everything looked normal. All that's missing is any kind of output signal and no, the output fuse was fine. That would have been too simple, so I had my work cut out. I like the way the A201 is built. It's mostly standard ICs, CMOS logic chips and op amps and plenty of each. Most are on sockets which could be an issue through corroded contacts but on the other hand makes replacing that easy. The main board contains the power supply, a VCO, a current ramp generator which is used by two signal shapers to produce triangle and sine waveforms. Rectangular, sine or triangular is all you get, none of that fangled arbitrary waveform stuff. There are three vertical PCBs. These are on the right the final power amplifier, in the middle the rise fall time control circuit with a frequency counter thrown in and on the left the pulse generator. It turns out that the RISE 4 board was an option which makes my 8201 technically an 8241 but I stick with calling it 8201. I think in the standard 8201 that board contains just the frequency counter. There's a fourth vertical PCB at the front which you can't see at the moment containing all the displays and buttons. On the left between the pulse generator board and the RISE 4 
control board is the brains of the unit, an 8031 microcontroller with separate chips for EPROM RAM and some battery backed up RAM to remember the last setting that has amazingly not failed yet but will probably soon. Judging from the date codes on the chips, this unit was built sometime in or after 1987, so it's around 34 years old now. The underside of the main board. It is rather busy, but it's easy to see that the top part is mostly the CPU section and the thick traces on the lower left are where the power supply is. The first rule when searching for any error is to check the supply voltages. There are no test points on the component side of the PCB, so it has to be done from the soldering side. I fixed the black test lead to the metal sleeve of one of the A201's BNC terminals as a ground. Plus 15 volts looks ok, but the minus 15 volts is just minus 0 0.1 volt. Plus 24 volts is ok, minus 24 volts is good enough, plus 5 volts looks ok as well. Conclusion: The minus 15 volt rail is dead. This is of course the first thing that needs investigation. In the A201 there is actually no way to disconnect a power rail from the power supply. It's all on the same main board, but on the soldering side the designer provided those four blobs. It turns out they have a very small gap that is bridged by solder. To disconnect the minus 15 volt rail from the power supply I had to use solder wick to remove all the solder from the blob bridging the gap. Unfortunately I never took a picture or video of this, so this diagram is all I can offer. Forgetting to capture something on camera happened a number of times during this repair because once I start I get easily lost in the process and tend to just work on instead of stopping to take pictures or videos. All I can say is that I'll try to improve. This is the relevant schematic of the plus minus 15 volt section of the power supply. There's nothing special here. The negative rail is regulated by a 7915. The positive one is adjustable to a small degree using an LM317. The reason for using an adjustable regulator for the positive rail is that it's important that both 15 volt rails have the same absolute voltage for the symmetry of the output signal. Hence, the first step in the alignment procedure is to measure the minus 15 volt rail to 10 millivolt accuracy and then adjust the positive rail to the same absolute value. But before I can even think of alignments, I need to fix it first. Once the connection blob is opened, the power supply part shows the expected minus 15 volts. That means the 7915 regulator has survived thanks to its internal current limiting protection, even though it got very hot. Now that the minus 15 volt connection is open and power is off, I can measure the rails resistance against ground. And sure enough, it's a dead short. The question now is, where is the short circuit? If I had a thermal imaging camera, I could have reconnected a rail and checked for hotspots. Without that, I have to resort to more traditional methods. The usual way is to look for suit marks of components that have released the magic smoke, or bulged caps. However, in this case, there were no obvious signs of any kind and that means more detective work is needed. Now in a unit as complex like this, searching for a short circuit is very much like looking for a needle in a haystack. This is how I did it. First I narrowed down the search area. The amplifier board on the right can be unplugged from the main board. With it unplugged, the short was still there. That means I can rule out the amplifier board as a culprit unless there would be a second short, but that's unlikely. Apart from a shielded signal cable, the pulse generator board on the left is really only connected by the flat ribbon cable you see. And the same is true for the display board which you can't see in this shot. I unplugged both of these cables and the short remained unchanged. This means the fault is on the main board itself or the lead trail pulse controller board in the middle. That one is plugged into the main board but in addition there is also some very tricky because hard to reach solder connections which you see here. To remove this board seems a lot of work, so I decided to leave that board in place for now and concentrate on the main board first. In some instances it's possible to see if the resistance value against ground shrinks as you get closer to the short circuit or increases when you move away, but in this case that did not work for me. The resistance of 0.3 ohms or so is already so low to be in the range of contact resistance of the meter probe with the PCB, so even 
Any slight variation in hand pressure when probing gives a different reading. A very common fault, especially in older electronics, are capacitors going open circuit or shortening. So the next thing I did was to study the parts list and schematics and create this spreadsheet with every electrolytic and tantalum capacitor in this unit as well as noting whether it could cause a short between minus 15 volts and ground. There are just five candidates, but of course, it's not certain because the short circuit could also be caused by something else. By the way, a second reason to make this spreadsheet is to act as a shopping list for replacing all problematic caps in the whole unit. And check out these two smoothing alcos for the 24 volt rail that are rated just 25 volts. That sounds awfully tight. Anyway, my plan is to replace them with a higher rated cap if I can fix the problem. Back to the investigation. Which of the caps could have failed? Usually they all seem to be okay. In the end, there was no other option than to desolder them one by one and test if the short was gone. By sheer luck, it happened to be the very first one that I desoldered. It's C69 that you see here, blocking off the minus 15 volt rail against ground. I should point out C68 up there, which is an identical capacitor doing the same thing against the plus 15 volt rail. Measuring C69 shows that it really has failed to be a dead short. Probably the 1 to 1.5 amp current limit of the 7915 regulator wasn't enough to cause any visible damage on it. The gap where C69 used to be, C68 is still there, but I have since replaced both capacitors with new ones. Since the short was gone, I closed the gap on the PCB with fresh solder to reconnect the minus 15 volt supply with the rail. And hooray! The minus 15 volt rail is now working. Let's see if that fixes the A201. Well, not exactly. But actually, these weird signals are quite a bit of good news because the output works, that is, the final amp seems to be working. I can change the signal shape between rectangle, sine, and triangle, and also where it distorted, it clearly shows at least partially the selected shape, so the selection as well as the signal shaping part seems to work to some extent. I can change the frequency, and that seems to be reasonably correct. Although you can't see it in these pictures, I can change the amplitude, so that part seems to do something as well. So quite a bit of A201 has come to life. But changing the signal offset does absolutely nothing. So this is the next thing to look at. The offset circuit is on the final amplifier board, so I took that board out. The cable to the output BNC needs to be desoldered, and there's another coax cable dangling here that connects it to the rise fall board. On the lower left you see two 20 pin connectors that connect this board to the main PCB. Having the board out allows me to replace some of its capacitors just in case. One of which you see here and that one actually did blow up sometime in the past but it turned out it had failed open. Another interesting observation is that someone decided to solder the output protection fuse permanently into the holder. Why would anyone do this? I could understand if someone decided to solder a wire in instead of a fuse, but soldering the fuse in makes little sense. If the fuse blows, it will be impossible to replace. In fact, I tried to unsolder it and in the end I had to completely replace fuse and holders. To find the offset problem on a final amplifier board, I had to power the A201 with a board accessible on the bench. I came up with this solution, which worked amazingly well, and the A201 has been like this for weeks now. Of course you can't run megahertz signals over this contraption, but tens of kilohertz are fine. I removed the chip switching the signal source from the socket and it turns out that the signals going into the final amplifier board are quite clean already, which is a huge sign of relief. So the distortion at the output is likely caused by the non-working offset circuitry. Without going into details, this is the main part of the schematics dealing with the signal offset. The circuit is located on the final amplifier board, not the main board. The CPU sends the desired offset as a serial data stream and a clock signal to the 8-bit shift register, a 4094. Once the desired data has been sent, the CPU activates the strobe signal, which copies the new data in the shift register to the internal 8-bit memory of the 4094 and makes it appear on the 8 output pins Q1 to Q8. 
So this part works to convert the serial data into parallel data. The A201 uses this method all over the place. You can see an example of the same kind on the right, which deals mainly with attenuation. In this case, the clock and strobe lines are connected to the other 4094, but the data lines are different, which means the shift register will contain different values when the common strobe signal happens. Back to the offset. The 8-bit parallel data word is connected to a 10-bit digital-to-analog converter AD7533. The two missing bits come from another 4094 shift register on another part of the schematics, to which this one was chained to form a 16-bit wide register. The AD7533 is a strange chip. It uses an internal R2R ladder to produce two analog currents, of which one is used here to drive the circuit below, which adds the positive or negative offset to the output signal. The sign is coming from that other shift register via this op-amp. The AD7533 reference voltage is produced by the Zener diode and the trim pot is used to calibrate the offset. I measured the output of the 7533 with different digital inputs and it did not move at all. The AD7533 is quite expensive from reputable vendors, but I found a source on eBay selling 3E for half the price of a single chip at RS Electronics. I gave that one a try and the eBay chip worked flawlessly. To be fair, DA conversion speed isn't critical in this application, so maybe that's the reason. This is my test setup. The A201 is standing on its side and it's often not very clearly visible in the following shots. Well, as you can see, the new AD7533 fixed the distortion. There are still lots of adjustments to be made, but it's looking not too bad. But does the offset adjustment actually work? Yes, it does. As I increase the negative offset, the trace on the DC couple scope slides lower. The meter in the back is only looking at the AC part, which stays the same. Let's try the other way. I'm using the increment and decrement function, which are relatively slow for adjusting large offsets. You can of course also enter offset values directly. Yes, the positive offset works as well. Enter the next problem, amplitude. You see, I can adjust the amplitude all the way up to 15 volts peak, which translates to roughly 10 volts RMS. So far, so good. But watch what happens when I reduce the amplitude to 4.7 volts. It jumps back to 15 volts. 4.8 volt peak and we have about 3.35 volts RMS. 4.7 volt peak and it's back to 10.3 volt RMS. If I decrease further, the voltage goes down as it should, but overall the output voltage is now way higher than it should. The part controlling the amplitude is quite complex to get your head around. I spent many hours on it. It follows the standard A201 pattern on the top here with another 8-bit shift register of type 4094. This converts the serial 8-bit word for the desired amplitude into a parallel 8-bit word at the outputs Q1 to Q8, with Q1 being the most significant bit. 12 comparators in 3 ICs of type LM339 are used to create 12 control signals that are either zero or pulled up to plus 24 volts using these 33K pull-up resistors, depending on whether the corresponding Q output goes lower than about 2.5 volts. These control signals go to eight pairs of MOSFET switches. The horizontal line on top is basically the signal coming from the preamp, while the horizontal line below leads to the offset circuitry, which is the last stage of the amplifier. The two lines form part of a voltage divider, the other part is another schematic. The MOSFET switches connect either the signal or some resistance to the divider and they are switched in combinations which makes it very tricky to understand the effects. It's a rather dense part of the PCB with all the MOSFET switch pairs and the associated resistors, diodes and caps. The three LM339 comparators driving this set are on the bottom left. I spent many hours checking the circuit, solder joints, swapping LM339s and 4094 chips temporarily to see if the problem moves, but it seems all in good order. My final test was to unplug the 4094, which is the equivalent of having all outputs high or selecting maximum output voltage, and then pull each output of the 4094 to ground with a jumper wire. The full output 
of about 10.3 volt RMS is halved when Q1 is pulled down, reduced to 3 quarters for Q2, 7 eighths for Q3, 15 sixteenths for Q4, and so on, on a nice binary fashion. It may not be that obvious, but what happens is that we start with full output and remove half, then a quarter, then an eighth, and so on with each bit. The binary pattern would be more obvious if testing the other way around by putting all outputs to zero and then successively each bit high, but that would require juggling a lot more patch leads. Anyway, I think the conclusion is that the analog part of the attenuator circuit works just fine, and I started to look at the digital part instead. For this, I need a probe, clock, data, and strobe lines going into the 4094 shift register, like you see here, although this is actually probing another 4094 chip. I simply forgot to make a video capturing that part, but it looks identical. This is how that looks on the scope. The yellow trace is the strobe signal. Basically that tells the 4094 to copy the last received data to the output. The blue trace is the data and the magenta one, the clock. The clock and data are often shared between other 4094s, so you see lots of data packets indicated by the clock bursts. But we are interested only in the one that immediately precedes the strobe signal for this chip. The 4094 chip records the state of the data line at the rising edge of the clock signal. This would require a rather tedious examination of clock and data signals, but luckily my trusty Rigel 1054Z can do the job automatically using the parallel decoder, even though the parallel part is only one bit deep in this case. Here is the command for 4.8 volts, which is the last value that is correct. Because I had to zoom in, the strobe signal is not visible, it's just to the right. The decoded data needs to be read from right to left and is 01010010 from most significant to least significant. If you like, it's the equivalent decimal value of 82, but of course that value itself has no meaning in this case. And here's the command for 4.7 volt, the first that causes the incorrect jump in amplitude. The decoded data from right to left is 11111101 or decimal 253, almost the highest possible value of 255. This means the jump to high output voltage has been commanded by the CPU and there's absolutely nothing wrong with the circuitry for amplitude, but there could still be an issue with the attenuator circuits. Remember this schematic from the problem with the offset and the bad digital analog circuit? Well, this time please look to the right because this is the control part for the attenuator circuit. It is yet another 4094 shift register driving through a driver chip for relay coils K1 to K4. For example, for the 1.5 volt range and 150 millivolt range, the amplitude circuit is commanded back to full voltage, but this chip activates combinations of additional attenuator relays that are put into the signal path to the output to reduce it to the right voltage. The complete circuit looks like this. The output signal goes in here and then through the four relays K1, if activated, reduces by 20 dB, which means the voltage is divided by 10. The same is true for K2, which is identical. K3 attenuates only by 10 dB, which is a factor of 3.16. K4 is just used for turning the output completely off or on. What combination of relays are activated is controlled by U15, so I probe this chip next. At 4.8 volts, the chip contained only zero and no relays active. At 4.7 volts, reading right to left is 0000, 000, 000 one zero zero zero. That means Q5 is active, but as you see in a schematic, Q5 is not connected to anything. If I decrement further to 1.5 volts, the value is 0, 0100100. 000, 000, 000, 000. That means Q2 is now on as well, and K3 is active. At 0 0.47 volts, the data changes to 0001100, 000, 000, 000, which means Q2 is off and Q4 is on. Relay key K3 turns off and K1 turns on. At 150 millivolts, the data changes again to 
0101100. Q2 comes back on. So now relays K1 and K3 are both on. At 47 millivolts, the data is now 0011100. Q2 is off again and Q3 comes on instead. This means relays K1 and K2 are active. And finally at 15 millivolts, Q2, Q3 and Q4 are all on and relays K1 to K3 are all active. Throughout all this, Q5 remains on while the voltage is below 4.8 volts. This is an interesting result. Firstly, relays K1, K2 and K3 act exactly like the software tells them to, so there is no fault in the attenuation circuit. But still, something is not right here. All values in red on the right are wrong. If you examine them closely, it turns out they are all 10 dBs too high. To me, that looks like the software expects an additional 10 dB attenuator driven by Q5. Well, that K5 relay does not exist in my hardware version, but if it would exist and be controlled by Q5, it would fix my amplitude problem. Now you may have noticed that I labeled this table with software version 1.6 because my theory is that my firmware was simply wrong for the final amplifier board in my 8201, assuming a fifth attenuator when there wasn't one. I contacted Tabo about this possibility but never got an answer. A different software version could totally work with the existing hardware as this hypothetical table shows. All the software needs to do is to command a 10 dB lower output level for 4.7 volts and below and the existing relays would produce the correct output voltage. Now, thanks to Tony, I had not only the manual but also a dump of his firmware, which was 1.7. Tony said that his 8201 did not show the jump in output voltage. So I got myself a new 16K EEPROM and burned Tony's revision 1.7 firmware into it. The upgrade from 1.6 to 1.7 did not go quite as smooth as shown here because the old EEPROM was stuck solid in the socket, but eventually I got it replaced. And it reported itself and worked just fine. But to my huge disappointment, the jump was still there. So much for this theory. At that stage I was about to give up and either live with a jump or build my own fifth attenuator. That is actually quite easy. There are spare driver sockets in U19, so all I have to do is connect pin 14 of U15 to one of the spare drivers and the output to a new relay K5 that I rig on the empty space next to the fuse on the final amplifier board. The 10 dB resistors would be a copy of K3 and I loop it into the signal path like so. But before embarking on that, I decided to test more functions because if there are any more major issues, I may abandon the whole project. To make handling of the unit easier, I decided to remove my tangle of extension wires and restore the final amplifier board back into the unit, a step that I later wished I had not done. And sure, there are more issues. For example, I can select 20 kHz as frequency, but not 19.99. It shows frequency error instead. So either I'm making a silly mistake or there is something wrong at the very heart of the generator. To rule out operator errors, I decided to spend time to actually read the manual from beginning to end. To my amazement, I found this sentence tucked away in a section discussing the use of the offset function. So there is actually another 10 dB attenuator, but it's in the pre-amplifier instead of the output of the final amplifier as all the others. I did check and this fact is not mentioned anywhere else in the manual, in particular not in the section on attenuators. I managed to find it. It's really activated by these two MOSFETs, one using a resistor and the other one for higher frequencies, a capacitor to attenuate the signal. Their gates are jointly controlled by the comparator U20 in form of an LM311. If we trace where the U20 gets its input from, which is a rather long way up and to the right, it leaves this sheet of the schematic with a very smudged notation where to continue, 
With some goodwill you can make out it continues to sheet 2 U15 pin 14. And that, you guessed it, is exactly Q5 of the shift register that I had examined for so long. So much for the notation not connected. Sure enough U20 is connected to U15. The lesson here, schematics can be wrong. Back to U20. I measured the signal at pin 7 when toggling between 4.7 and 4.8 which makes pin 2 jump between 5 volts and 0 respectively. The divider at pin 3 provides about 1 volt to compare against. Regardless of the input, the output was steady at about minus 9 volt disabling the attenuator. The testing is difficult because the heatsink blocks direct access while the final amplifier board is installed. This is where I wish I had not removed my extension wire so hastily. Anyway, I removed U20 from its socket which should pull the output high to 24 volts. And sure enough, the output from 15 to 4.8 volts is now 10 decibels too low because the attenuator is now on when it shouldn't be. At 4.7 volts the output jumps because now the overall attenuation settings are as they should be. On the scope meter you can see the peak to peak voltage is 9.4 volts which exactly matches 2 times 4.7 volt because the selection on the front panel is peak not peak to peak voltage. For comparison at the 4.8 volt setting we should see 9.6 volt peak to peak but because the 10 dB attenuator is now permanently on we measure a value that is 3.6 times too small. 9.6 volts divided by 3.16 is 3.04 volts which is exactly what is shown on the scope meter. So the attenuation circuit works but the comparator possibly not. Because it is quite inaccessible I replicated the circuit around U20 on a breadboard. The meter in the background measures the output voltage while the blue meter shows the input. You can see that regardless of input the output does not change. That chip is certainly faulty. On the right you see a pack of 10 LM311P that I got from eBay and none of these work in the unit or in the test circuit either, but they behave differently. The new chips get very hot within seconds drawing more than 30 milliamps on the negative rail. Quite honest, I don't know why. Are these duffed chips or labeled wrongly? The LM311 is a strange beast and I have seen reports that chips from different manufacturers work in some circuits and others won't. I have ordered some LM311N to see if that fixes it. I hate to end on a cliffhanger but the video is too long already anyway so I'll let you know in the next installment what the outcome is and about the frequency error and whatever other faults are still waiting for their discovery. If, and that's a big if at the moment, I get this 8201 to work, I will add a section showing what it can do. So if you have not subscribed already, hit that button and the notification bell so you don't miss the next video. And maybe consider becoming a Patreon, link in the description. As Patreon you get early access to videos, a blog and other exclusive content. Thanks for watching.